Today my guest on We Are High Stakes Poker is John Robert Belland. John Robert is one of the most beloved members of the high stakes community, whose fame exploded when he appeared on the Chinese version of Survivor, something that he will tell you is one of the most challenging moments of his life. His persona broke living when he traveled around the world playing in the highest stakes games in the world, minus a punk roll, became stuff of legend. And today we talk about that time period, we talk about his background, we talk about his purpose in life, vision for the future, and the strategies that got him from uh, a little place in Taiwan to playing in the highest stakes games in the world. Jean-Robert Bolland. Is that pronounced right? Bolland? Bolland, yes. Not Bolande. Someone, I was looking at an old interview and someone was calling you Bolande. I was like, that don't sound right. Yeah, it's Bolland. Um, I'm half Chinese, half English, which... Um, didn't give me the easiest childhood when I was younger. Um, I think, are you mixed race as well? I'm uh, not mixed, but uh, uh, my parents are from Haiti and they're obviously light-skinned Haitians, so. Uh, but I grew up in, uh, in Taiwan, actually. You grew up in Taiwan? Yeah. What was it like growing up in Taiwan being not of Taiwanese descent? Was it difficult for you? Um, actually, uh, there's a cool expat, expat community over there and uh, we uh, we went to American school okay right right international school so you just you mix with American kids yeah and uh, it was great to be honest with you I wish I had uh, gone to at least uh, a year or two of uh, Chinese school that way my Mandarin would have been a lot more fluent you do speak Mandarin though I right? speak a little bit but a lot of the American community out there they'll send their their kids to like a preschool and kindergarten Chinese just to get that background and then send them to the American school afterwards. And I think that's a great idea. And as you was growing up as a kid, what when you looked forward and you were dreaming in your bed when you're there alone, what is it that you wanted to be when you were growing up career-wise? Interesting. Uh, when I grew up, uh, my, my father was out there doing uh, international trade, trading fabrics, textiles, and... Uh, uh, I remember that telex machine going off in the middle of the night, and that was always an exciting thing for the family when the telex started jumping right. up and down because it meant he was getting some sort of order, and uh, order meant good good uh, money coming yeah. in for the family. So uh, yeah, so I, I just wanted to be in international trade and be a businessman like my dad, kind of be an entrepreneur. That's that's what I wanted to do. It's funny because um, I look. My, my dad's not a, a very loving, caring dad. It, not that he doesn't want to be, but is. Is, you know, it's just the old way. Old school, yeah. Old school, you got it. And, um, you know, I wanted for my kids to want to be like my dad because I never wanted to be like my dad. What was your relationship with? Because you lost him, didn't you? At a... Yeah, no, I lost my dad. I actually lost both, both my parents, I'd say about 12, 12 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, Pops was real hard on me growing up. That's kind of the way his parents were on him. Uh, loving, but at the same time, real, like, kind of harsh and strict. And, you know, I, for the most part, I was, you know, a mischievous character, but a good kid. And uh, I just was one of those guys that didn't like to study a lot in school. I did pretty decent in school, even though I didn't put much studying in. And that went on through college. So, um, and I feel like I never really pushed myself. My little brother was a little more into the books, and he went to MIT and did very well over there. But, uh, yeah, just uh, uh, pops, you know, and it's interesting because he was brutal early on. And then somehow later on in life, uh, he gave up uh, drinking and just all of a sudden became like a real peace type of guy. You know, his pleasure was just hanging out in the garden and, you know, building tomatoes and avocados. And that was that was just his love all of a sudden. I saw, you know, I saw exactly the same thing with my, I saw exactly the same thing with my granddad. He, he was a real bad egg, and then all of a sudden he stopped drinking, and this new beautiful guy came up. And I see it with my dad as they get older. It's almost like they, they see how other people raise their kids, and they, they change a little bit. And okay. It's quite beautiful, actually. Well, I, I think the world is uh, just getting more educated, you know, just like, uh, you know, the, the, how poker's evolved so much, parenting, and just uh, the way people educate their children and bring up their kids is it's just getting all around better you know you see in the news uh, just yesterday about how saudi arabia they're starting to allow women to drive and everything and for us it's just madness it uh, you know but, but it, i mean but it's just a step towards you know uh, 
I just think the betterment of the world, just, you know, the, this, this thing of uh, uh, women and men being treated equally. And, you know, when, when somebody goes and looks at their company as a CEO and sees, hey, you know what? The men in my company are getting paid more than the women. And, you know, and our old school thinking is like, well, shoot, you know, the women have to, you know, be there for the kids and everything. So it just seems to make sense that the men should, but hey, what, you know, we can get beyond this. We don't have to have these preconceived, you know, notions from old school. And, yeah. and uh, I just like seeing uh, just, you know, just in my 47 years old, I'm younger, older, whatever, but it just, watching the, the world just improve and us in America trying to, to, to make ourselves a better community. So 47 years on this planet, you've got four years on me, uh, JRB. Um, what have been some of the toughest challenges that you've had to face that you've had really valuable lessons out of them? So you, they were tough, but you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't go back and get rid of them in your life because they've made you the man you are today. What, what are some of those challenges? <laughs> well, I mean, when you say that, the first thing that comes to mind is Survivor. Right. Like, there's zero chance they're going to put me back on Survivor. But that was absolute hell. And the interesting thing is I didn't really want to go on Survivor. I was recruited. And uh, even when I was recruited, part of the reason why I was even interested in the whole idea of it is because... The recruiter happened to be a hot girl that I was trying to <laughs> trying to hang out with, so I was just entertaining her just offer, like, yeah, yeah, just so okay. I could go out and have some drinks is. with her. Right, exactly. <laughs> like she it. she won one of the shows, Big Brother or something like that before. Right. But uh, yeah, so and all of a sudden I'm around this group of people that's just dying to be on Survivor, and I'm like, well, dude, everybody's like dying to get on the show, you know, maybe. Let me just like entertain. And all of a sudden, you're around, you know, at that time it was like 5,000 people sending their videos, and then they reduced the group to 100, then 40, and, it, and then everybody's hoping to make that next cut. And all of a sudden, I found myself, ah, oh, yeah, and let's, let's try this out. And then when you're on the show, and it's absolutely miserable on there, you know, you definitely don't want to be the first one to go home. And then you're out there, and you're like, first place pays a million dollars. You know, there's only 16 people, you know, three or four people have left. Hey, you know, let's give this a whirl, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And you know, you start calculating as a as a poker player. You know, you start thinking, well, first place is a million, second place is a hundred thousand. There's seven people left, eight, nine people left, whatever. And uh, you know, I've got some equity in here. Let's uh, let's let's you know, let's let's try this hard. And I, uh, I, I like that was an experience that uh, that was brutal. And I'm so glad I did it. And uh, would I say I'm a better person today because I did it? Nah, I don't think so. But uh, it was definitely uh, a life accomplishment and something I'm proud of that I, that I did. I wish I went a little further, made it on the jury. It was fun. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be impossible, isn't it, to get get in your forties and not experience some suffering that molds you into the human being you are today. And I imagine you had a lot of suffering on that show. I've seen a few of them myself. Um, I mean, that must have been a really proud moment of yours, looking back on that. What, what other moments have uh, really bring up a sense of pride for you when you look back on your life? Um, I just, you know, not too long ago, a few years ago, I took second in that Players' Championship. I was heads up for the bracelet. I still don't have a bracelet, by the way, and there's a good chance I may never get one. But, uh, but that, that was kind of cool because the Players' Championship you know, the most coveted bracelet out there, obviously, is the main event. But the Players' Championship's a cool thing because it's like it's all the best players in the world just, you know, fighting for this thing. Yeah. And just to see that, uh, and it's not just one form of poker, it's multiple forms of poker. That, you know, that I'm mixing it up with the, with the best of the best. And, you know, I, uh, you know, did pretty well. And, and to be honest with you, I played quite well in that tournament. And, uh, well, I thought I did anyways, you know, I'm sure there were some people out there, oh, that donkey, he, 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 you know, but you know, to this day, you know, people still talk about Phil Helmuth being a donkey, but I mean, after you have, is it 14 bracelets he has? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, the naysayers just kind of, <laughs> what, what can you say? You I, know, I, I, yeah. I, I, I was having a conversation with a really good poker player this morning. I won't mention any names, but the same thing happened. He was like, um, I don't rate this person's play, but he wins all the money, so he must be doing something. And it just shows you how many different ways you can approach poker, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, John Monette, in my opinion, I, uh, I've, I've known him for a long time. He's 
one of the greatest poker players out there for sure. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because uh, I heard somebody in the pool hall the other day say, John Bonnet has three bracelets or something like that. And, and I said, yeah, well, he, he's one guy who has three and probably should have five. Yeah, yeah. You know, he got it in, uh, he was induced to seven no limit tournament with Phil Ivey and he had a pat hand with Ivy drawn all in to, to get, he had to catch inside an eight or nine, you know, to, to uh, and he had it twice, uh, two, you know, chances where he's a favorite to actually have the bracelet right there. And then uh, I actually had a, I had, oh man, the most painful one that I missed a bracelet. I was playing a limit hold'em. It was a limit hold'em shootout and uh, I'm heads up for the bracelet. I had a 19 to one chip lead, okay? Uh, shake hands, make the deal, and I got the bracelet. I was in it. And, uh, we're playing and they want us to play out a couple hands. Well, we start playing a couple hands out and then uh, he wins and I start getting frazzled and everything about how he's won those pots and all of a sudden he, he, he like doubles up, doubles up, doubles up and all of a sudden even in chips and I completely forgot I had made a deal with this guy already. Oh no. You know, and, and when we were even, all of a sudden I ask him and I'm completely frenzied. I said, uh, I said, uh, you want to you just uh, chop, chop the, uh, the, the, the money and we, we just play for the break? And he's like, absolutely. <laughs> but it, I, I'd completely forgotten. I, I, you know, I had already made a deal with him. Right. I gave him $20,000 on top of second place. He had, he had a nub like this. And uh, man, I, uh, wow. What happened there? And then, so that, that well, that would have been my bracelet. No, no, I was, I was looking before we talked and I could see that you, you'd almost hit two of them. And, and back then, you know, you, you was playing a lot of tournaments and yeah, yeah, things, have changed, things have changed a lot since then. Who, who has been the biggest inspirations in your life? As far as? Life, poker, it doesn't have to be poker, you know, who, because the way I see it, the, your success in life today, and, and it's undoubted that anybody looks at your life, okay, we can't, we can't pigeonhole what you do, you know, like you're not a gas fitter or a welder or something, but you're a very successful person. So you can't do that alone. There must be, there must be somebody that you looked up to and thought. Oh. Well, I, I will tell you that uh, part of my willingness to like kind of put it all in and risk being busted or living on the edge, even though I, I, my bankroll might not uh, be there to be able to afford the thing. You know, I, I, my mom was just a woman of faith and just, you know, she, all she wanted to make sure is that her kids had a good education and a, a decent place, but we didn't have any money growing up. And, uh, but uh, my mom just always just had this positive attitude, positive attitude. It didn't matter how brutal our situation was. She just saw the positivity in it. And I, I got a lot of that from my mom. It's like, you know, hey, you know, let's make the best of this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I took a lot of that from her. And, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of the poker communities, they don't necessarily see a lot of the struggles. Oh, oh this guy is broken, living like a millionaire. He is a millionaire, this, that, whatever. You know, they might not see some of the real life struggles. You go ups and downs. And, uh, you know, the cool thing, years ago, I actually posted my bankroll on Twitter. And that was a real thing. I mean, I posted my actual bankroll and when I was busted and they didn't hear from me for three weeks because I was depressed and all that, that was real, the real deal. And, and uh, you know, later on I started getting involved in some games where, you know, uh, I'm playing with uh, wealthy business guys where I can't really put their business out there. So I, I, I couldn't uh, expose myself too much because then they would know what the other people uh, I was playing with might might be. You know, by telling my results, I might be inferring their results. Yeah. So, so I stopped doing that. But that was that was a cool, fun thing. You know, and now that I'm married, I can't. You know, no longer do it's, that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it was really interesting because back then you was one of the greatest proponents of building a brand. That, you know, you was you was a business. You was an empire. I mean. Was that a very conscious decision to do that or did it just happen by complete action? It's interesting that you say that. You know, I, I, I went to school and I have a marketing degree and I've always been fascinated by marketing and advertising. And uh, um, believe it or not, it was, uh, I saw Jenna Jameson, the porn star, t Twitter, and uh, she was just getting wrecked by her haters. 
and she kept retweeting all these haters. And, and I was like, man, I, uh, this is kind of cool because you kind of get in her corner. And I'm like, man, I can't believe that she would retweet. That's really brutal stuff they're saying about her. But it's kind of like, hey, I love that she's being transparent and she's giving them a voice. And so I started to do that. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, at the time, I felt like, man, 90% of these 50,000 people that are following me on Twitter uh, hate me. But no, it's the ones that uh, they're just being loud and they love being a, a platform where I'm retweeting. Uh, they, they were being brutal to me. You're in the community. Yeah. They're being communicated with. They're, they're not re They're not hitting a dead wall, are they? It, it, you know? it was something I learned. And, and it's, sometimes I try and engage and argue with them and everything. And, uh, you, know, you know, that stuff doesn't work. You know, it's funny because uh, Lauren... Uh, tried to engage with some of her haters, and Kevin Hart's like, Lauren, you can't do this. Trust me, I, I know you can't. You can't. I've been trying to, to fight with the haters forever. There's there's no win right there. And he, I, it was funny because he was trying to counsel her, and I'm just in complete agreement because I know. Look, you can't beat the haters. The haters, just, listen. The haters. That's the haters. Hey, enjoy the haters. I love my haters. I love my fans. And uh, you know, uh, I'm not mad at you. They. You don't like the way I do it. That's 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 on you. I got no problem with that. Yeah, well, there's, there's not many people that come across with a, a world-renowned porn star as an inspiration in life. So there's a, there's a, there's a first. Isn't that funny? How, let me ask you this question. Um, we all we all get haters these days because we've all got a social media platform, especially if we're in a business where we're producing something creative, and that that is a broad span. How how, do, how does it affect you? Does it? Does it hurt? It hurts the hell out of me. Oh, back in the day, it used to hurt me. It, it actually doesn't phase me one bit. It, it doesn't. You know, some of it uh, might come from, hey, this person genuinely doesn't like you. Some of them might be, maybe they're kind of jealous. And for me, a lot of it was a lot of regular guys back home that felt they had just as much poker skill as I did, and they're back home having to go do a nine to five and suffering through, you know, wife nagging them, the kids driving them nuts and everything. And I'm out here traveling all over the world, first class flying private, and they're feeling like they can play poker every bit as I can. And how come I'm living this good life? And there's a, you know, and, 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 and you got to respect that. Hey, this is, uh, you know, this, some of this stuff isn't fair. And while I'm bitching about a bad beat, you know, and uh, getting my uh, aces cracked or something like that, it's like they would love to be out there getting their aces beat. And, 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 you know, sometimes in life, and it's like, you know, I always tease my wife because uh, I married a beautiful Mexican girl uh, just recently, got married on the beach in, in Mexico. I always tease her about how I used up all my good luck marrying her. Because, I mean, when I come out of a poker session, I'm like, you know, it's like you want to pull your hair out. You're just like, how can this keep going on? You know, you just, you feel like you're doing everything correctly. You're getting your money in good and the results the same. And it's like, what in the world? And then, you know, and if I could trade all of it right now, for sure I would say that I'm, I'm in front. I'm way in front. It's not even close. So, uh, you know, sometimes I got to catch myself from whining and bitching and, you know. <laughs> and by the way, all that bitching, it, it, it doesn't really help for a poker game because, uh, you know, people want to be around where it's a fun environment. And it's really hard. When you're losing, you're getting your brains bashed in, you just want to sometimes pout or whatever, or you just want a recognition, say, hey, dude, this guy's runs really shitty or, you know, getting his brains breathed in. But, you know, that doesn't help you at all. And I've found that sometimes when you do get them to feel sorry for you, uh, what's going to happen is they're going to stop trying to give you action because they they, they they don't want to see you get beat anymore. So so now they're not going to call you and now you have aces and all of a sudden everybody folds to you. It's like, you know, so you definitely don't want to be that. You want to be the guy that's fun to beat. You know, Vivek, Tom Dwan, these are guys, great examples of that. You know, uh, Antonio Esfandiari, they, they make it so much fun to beat them that you're yeah, like, hey, you know what? I know this person's great, Andrew Robel. I know this person's a very, very good poker player, but there's so much fun to play with. Right. Being fun to play with, and that's one of the things I like to tell poker players. It doesn't matter how good a poker player you are. If you're not fun to play with, People are just not going to want to play with you, and it's like you're not going to get the action. I get all the action, for sure, and that's a big, big plus for me. I get all the action. There's not a game out there that I don't get invited to. Right. I don't have a seat with. You know, a lot of people might say that's because you're terrible. Of course they want to play with you.
Well, you know, maybe, maybe a I little th bit. I think it's a, I think it's a, lo a lot more than that. You, you, you don't end up friends with Kevin Hart just because you're a. He doesn't, he doesn't need your money, dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kevin Hart's your friend because you've got this energy that he wants to be around. And, you know, let's go back to your marketing background again because I, I look at high-stakes poker players or the people who make it to the top of the game. You're all businesses. You're all brands. You're all, you've, all got to, um, you've all got to live and abide by a certain set of rules of why you're out of the game, right? So how important was that marketing background in terms of you levering relations, leveraging relationships? So you do end up in those games. You do end up in those jets. You do end up, um, and not artificially neither, really making really solid, deep connections with the right type of people that are going to progress you as a, as a person. How has that transformed itself in your life? It, it, it's interesting when you say that because the marketing, the marketing doesn't necessarily translate into the relationships. Like the people that... I consider my friends, my immediate community, you know, are few and far between. I mean, I know a lot of people and I get along with a lot of people, but the people that are family and really close, um, and that's not just necessarily about the money. Part of it is people like that uh, I'm a pretty transparent guy. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I always joke about how I'm the same person, win or lose, uh, you know, at the poker table. And the reason why I say it is because it's clear, you know, when I'm losing, you can see I'm pouty or grumpy. And when I'm happy, you know, I'm telling stories, drinking the wine, you know, smiling, having a great time. And that's always been who I am. And, and, and it's not just in poker, it's uh, in w whatever I'm doing. I'm a competitive person, you know, and I'm playing pool or basketball, anything like that. You know, I would kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. That's who I am. And some people like it, some people hate it. Um, uh, the marketing thing, and you know, as you were talking about the building in France, I actually believe this, believe it or not, the Dan Bilzerian, who's also uh, a friend of mine, oh, he and I, he I and I are tied again. Yeah. Back in the day, he and I were real close, and then uh, then uh, we didn't talk for a while, and now, you know, he, he and I are good again. But uh, I actually believe that he saw what I was doing on Twitter, uh, and he's like, man, this guy's broke living. I, I he's like, he's like, he's like, forget this broke living. I'm gonna show these guys rich living. Yeah. And he just went and made himself transparent and showed, hey, you know, guns, money, travel, and all this other stuff, and just took it to another level. And you know, while I'm sitting over there with fifty thousand followers, this guy's got whatever twenty million, thirty million. I don't even. I, after a number of million, I don't even. You lose count. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. But I mean. Um, uh, Hart's the one who's like the most incredible with building a brand. I watched the other day him in an interview. I guess he, he wants to be worth a billion dollars like by the time he's 40 or something like that, 45. He's like four or five years from now. And uh, I mean, it seems like he's on track. You know, I'm rooting for him. That's a hard, hard worker. This, it's unbelievable. He's just working nonstop and then always getting up 6 a.m. to go to the gym. You know, it's... it's it's unreal. I mean, it's, some, it's, a, it's a trait, obviously, that's in poker as well, isn't it? It's very unusual to find someone who's not solidly sticking it in, like every two minutes they're working or they're studying or they're playing, and that's how most people end up being at the very top of the game. Um, I mean, when it comes to poker, everybody needs to build a set of fundamentals first and then build all the flowery, uh, wonderful stuff above that. And I guess it's the same in life as well, right? We need fundamentals that get us through life, that attract you to people like Kevin Hart and stuff. So what are the kind of values, you know, the fundamentals, the principles of life that are really important to you, that, you know, if someone crosses them, that it feels really kind of not right? What are those? You know, it, 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 it's, it, it, as soon as you said that, first thought that comes to mind is this guy, Richard Branson. And somebody asked him, what, 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 what's a thing that really annoys you with people? And, and he just said, when people are discourteous, you know, it's, that's just so real. Look, it's, it, it doesn't matter how annoyed you are. Just be polite, be warm, be friendly, you know. It's so annoying when people are being brutal to the dealers. And you know, a lot of the guys I run with, these guys are, are spoiled, rich people. And it's like, you know, just don't be discourteous to the staff, to the dealers. They're doing their job. And by the way, today they're doing their job even less affecting the game than ever because of these these machines. How can you be annoyed with the dealer or throw cards at the dealer when it's the machine that spit it out? <laughs> yeah. You know, in Las Vegas, when the, the cards come out of the machine, we still cut it one time. In uh, San Jose, they actually don't even cut the deck. And and I, 
I don't know if I'm a fan of cutting it or not, but it really cutting the deck, honestly, I guess it's just wasting time because uh, maybe you get in one uh, more deal every hour if, uh, if you don't cut the deck. Uh, you know, really, wh why do we cut the, cut the deck after it comes out of the machine? Those deck mates too, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's just a habit, I think, half the time. Habit, and maybe people like to see it, but it is, uh, but it is it's, a, it's an unnecessary thing. But uh, So you, don't, you like your politeness is important to you. What else is important to you? Um, I mean, what's, what's important to me? I, uh, yeah, just uh, cherishing the people that are dear to you, you know. Family. You know, when you, when you were talking about, uh, like, who are the people, you know. For me, like, my idols in life are, were my mom, who's gone now, my little brother. Just a good guy. He goes out and uh, works in New York. And, and by the way, he makes pretty decent money. But with the wife and uh, three kids in New York, you know, it's still like a, a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. You know, uh, more than it's a little bit of a struggle. I mean, I see, and he's very, very good with finances and, and works his butt off. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's interesting for me because I see him, he went the nine to five route and I went the poker route. And, uh, you know, sure, I have my struggles. He has his struggles, whatever. And, but it's just, this is part of it. everyday life. I got a best friend who uh, went to Harvard Law School lives in Houston, raising a couple of kids there and uh, doing well. But again, it's like uh, everybody's got their family and their struggles and, you know, finances and all of that. And, uh, you know, recognizing where you're at and being grateful for the things that you have going for you and for the opportunity. And that's one thing for me is I've been really fortunate and I haven't capitalized on it. And perhaps that's why my relationships are as strong as they are is because I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to infringe on this relationship. This person's got access to this, so let me, uh, you know, and I, I've never exploited that. Um, and perhaps I've squandered opportunities too, you know, but uh, for sure, like if I decided to go and do a project or whatever, I do have like a support group that uh, might be around there. Or they might say, oh, this guy's a poker DJ and I want nothing to do with investing in that. I was, was going to ask you that because, <laughs> like you say, your, your acquaintances, we'll call them, mm -hmm. is probably vast. And then you have a, an inner circle of people who you love that you call family, whether they're blood related or not. Um, but who are the people who are surrounding you on the more frequent basis? Who, who's in your ear the most? Right, right, right. Well, for me, I'm very, very fortunate to be super tight with uh, Andrew Robel. It's interesting because right now he actually, he's building a home, but we live in the, we both live on the same floor in the Mandarin. And, uh, um, you know, uh, he and I were constantly uh, talking and, uh, you know, I, I, I've learned a lot about poker from him, even though he's like, much younger than I am, I, I, I've learned a lot from him. And he's just a really, really good guy, you know, and uh, watching him grow. Um, back in the day, I thought he was like a little bit socially awkward, but it's like really endearing, <laughs> it, but a really, really good, good human good. being yeah. and uh, very fair business guy and, uh, you know, rooting for him. And then there's Bobby Baldwin, who, uh, who you know, he's, my boss, but he's not really my boss. He's like, my boss is boss is boss, but he's like a personal mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I call him my friend as well, uh, even though I work for the guy, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, when I first started hanging out with Bob Bolden, he would say something, and I would go home and write, take notes on some of the things I would learn from him. And uh, now, you know, just to have this person in my life and to learn so much from him, uh, it's, uh, uh, and I don't want to, you know, hurt his image by saying that I've learned a lot from him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, you're being too, you know, you're no, 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 but no, but I, here I am. I mean, I, I'm I'm running around on almost a daily basis with a living legend. Mm. I mean, this guy, he's going to go down as one of the, you know, greatest, uh, most memorable uh, members of the gambling community ever. But that's, but that's no accident, right? So I think it was Stephen Covey who, who said, like, you are, are somebody said, you're the, you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. So if that is true, then who those five people are, and we choose who they are, our choices become really important, right? Now, I'm not saying you woke up one morning and wrote it all down and said, right, who are the five people in the world that I could be friends with? 
but it's happened. You've magnetized it, you've made it happen, and then there are people that it hasn't happened for. Why has it happened, John LaPierre? What well, are you doing right? Well, you know, uh, what am I doing right? <laughs> when you say that, I think to myself, wow, you know. Uh, well, let's see, when Guy La Liberté met Bobby Baldwin, he was a jungler, juggler at Venice Beach, and now he just sold Cirque du Soleil for $2 billion. And, you know, uh, going to Bobby's office and saying, hey, uh, you know, I have this idea to do a circus but with no animals, and anybody else would have thrown this guy out of their office. And Bobby you know, said, "Hey, you know, that's interesting. Let's let's work this concept." And and uh, you know, started out Cirque du Soleil. This is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And then you got Andrew Sasson, who was a door guy and having trouble with his investor backers. And Bobby went and invested with uh, whatever he got. Got uh, Bellagio to build light, and then Light Group, and then they sell that. And now you know, Andrew Sasson's worth a couple hundred million. And here I am. Hey, I'm I'm next. <laughs> What's the problem? So we're talking balls. Are we, talking, are we talking balls here? Is that what it is? Uh, are we talking balls? I don't know. No, because just... fear, fear prevents, like, mm. you know, fear prevents people from going up to a Phil Ivy or a Bobby Borden, right? Everybody wants to, but fear stops them. But obviously it hasn't stopped you, right? Mm. You've said, you, you've felt the same rush. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, fuck it. Just, just go and do it, you oh, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting because, I mean, I was one of those guys with my face on the window of Bobby's room looking in there and seeing Chip Reese, Bobby. Oh, my gosh, that's Bobby Baldwin. <laughs> it, it, it is interesting because sometimes we're around because uh, you would never know if you were just at a, 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 grabbing a, grab a cocktail at a bar with Bobby Baldwin. You would never, never know that this guy is like a legend. And sometimes I would tell me, yeah, when I met him, like, I was like, my face was planted on the window. Like, man, I wonder, I, I wonder if he'd be all right with me taking a picture with him or something like that. That's exactly Exactly how I was. That's what that's what it was. So you you built you built this brand of um, being broke, living, running around the world, living life as a millionaire without any money. Yeah. Now that then strikes me as somebody who is a bit of a paradox here because it seems like there's no purpose in that because you're just traveling around the world trying to make as much money as you can. But it's also very clever. So it also does feel like it's a purpose. So let me ask you this question. What's your purpose right now? Right now, as you exist, what is it all about? What are you What are you playing poker for? Who are you playing for? What are you doing? What are you doing it for? Well, now it, it's actually shifted. It shifted because I've just been recently married and thinking about starting a family now. So now my purpose is now, back then, it's like balls to the wall, fall flat on your ass, it doesn't matter because it's just me, I'll just get up and start all over. You know, now that the wife and hopefully in the future, the kids, you know, now that that's a new factor, now safety, security, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, future is like a, a much higher priority. And I'm just making that shift now. Right, right. Yeah. And, and while doing that, also going through like uh, just a terrible run at poker. I mean, like just getting tortured. At the wrong time. <laughs> Tortured. I mean, it's been unbelievable. And, you know, people, you, you know, you have these runs and everything, but I mean, it, it's like sitting there, wow, man, this can't be happening again, <laughs> you know? But uh, but it happens. It happens to all of us. And, you know, and I, I know that some people, again, watching this interview, oh my gosh, how can this guy be talking about a bad run? He's over there in Montenegro, you know, mixing it up with the best of the best. It, but, uh, it, but I'm just saying, these things happen. And now, before, again, it was... Myself now I got to say oh wow now I got a new wife that I got to look after as well So it's not just the same as like, you know You go bad bad luck, you know starting again tomorrow now We got to really be thinking about not just me family So your, your purpose now is switched from I'm an inspiration to uh, the John John Robert Ballon fans to I'm an inspiration to my wife and to my future children and that's what I'm playing for. Well, that's the priority. That's, that's priority. the priority. Okay. Yeah. So where do we where do we three to five years from now? Well, you know, three to five years. Like I said, hopefully, I'm uh, feeling a little more secure. And to be honest with you, uh, two or three years ago, I was much much better off than I am right now. Uh, you know, and that's partly because of. Uh, you know, good runs, bad runs, whatever. But, uh, you know, three years ago, I was in, like, fantastic shape. And now it's just a little bit of struggling, you know, that goes on. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be just fine. Three years from now, uh, you know, I, I, whew, three years from now, man, I 
really hope we're in really, really good shape. Hope is, it, is it just poke you think about, though? Because, like, I'm, I'm 43, so I'm a, little, I'm a little bit younger than you, but something happened when I turned 40, and every now and then I just, I just catch myself thinking about mortality. <laughs> I just catch myself thinking, 40 years, boom, like that. So the next 40 is going to go boom like that. So I need to get my shit in order right now and figure out what I want to do, how I'm going to get everything sorted out. Do you have thoughts like that? Or are you, are you just so tunnel visioned in the moment? Are you, are you able to like freak the fuck out a little bit about approaching 50? Um, the approaching 50 doesn't bother me as much. I, approaching 40 freaked me out a lot. I'm 47 right now. and. Yeah, I've just noticed that every year is like, hey, you know what? This is this is this is a great year, great age, and you know, uh, um, I did think that if I was going to get married, I'd get married a little younger than now. You know, it's like I'm 47. I I just had friends from high school at my wedding, and their kids are like getting ready to graduate college, and I'm thinking about starting to have a kid right now. And it, it, this was my high school roommate, you know what I mean? And it's like for them, the thought of like starting a new family right now, wow, bizarre, but. Uh, um, yeah. Hey, at least so you, uh, uh, as a man, we're okay. We can still fire them out. <laughs> it doesn't matter how okay, old we yeah, are. Yep, yep. We just got to meet someone young enough to take it. You right, know? right, 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 right. Um, what about strategies a little bit then? So you, after we finish talking, you're going to go and play poker in, in a game that very few people in the world would even get access to, mm. would even get an invite to, would even have the skills to be able to sit down, right? So what are the key strategies that, that you can think of in life, which one or two, that got you in these games? Not, not just technical skills as a poker player, but how did John Robert Ballon get from Taiwan to playing in these huge games? Oh, right, right, right. Well, it, it's interesting you say it because I, I actually kind of create the games, you know? It's like uh, building the relationships, uh, meeting new people, inviting them. And, uh, you know, as you say that, I, I can think of, like, to be honest with you, in the last year, I have not uh, marketed the game and uh, myself as much as I could have, you know? And that's probably a good idea for me in the next year or two, because, uh, you know, I've developed the relationships I do have, but as far as bringing in new business, uh, that's, that's a, a thought that I should constantly be like doing and developing. And to be honest with you, there's, there's some other guys that have, you know, done similar things to what I've done and, and doing just fine on different scales, much smaller scale maybe. Um, and, uh, you know, there are times when, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, doing like a small game, you know, might, uh, might be optimal and yeah. But you never would have been able to be in this position to create those games had you not built up the GRP persona, right? Perhaps. Um, I mean, I think all of it works together with it. All of it. All of the things that my background has, including speaking Mandarin, for example, mm -hmm. like just being over here and, you know, when certain people come here and just being able to just communicate in their language, you know, they feel a little endearing. It's like, it's just like, hey, wow, that's kind of cool. And all of a sudden I have the ear of this person. And uh, um, which translates into, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll come visit you at Aria, which is not just good for the poker room, but it's good for the casino if you know, such and such goes in the Baccarat pit and you know plays, whatever. And even if they win, it's still good for us in the long run because that means they're just going to come back, maybe bring other friends. And, you know, so it, it all, it, it, it all works. All the things work. And it's not just me. It's me with, you know, Bobby Baldwin and, the, and uh, by the way, the Aria poker staff. I mean, it, it is cool to sell cars if you've got selling Bentleys or Ferraris. And you know, we got the greatest poker room in the world. Mm -hmm. Ivy Room literally is the best room in the planet to play poker. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I've got the best tools. Everything just kind of working together. And even, so like I said, I'm over here playing Montenegro, you know, mix it up with the Asians and everything. And the fact that I speak a little Mandarin, you know, like these things help. So it's just using all the tools that are available to me. It's just, everything's just coming together. And um, you, you became JRB, the, they will call it the, it's not a fictional JRB because it exists, but you, the persona, mm. because, because of your 
grandiose ability to take risks. What is, what is the one risk right now that you're not taking? That you, that you know you should be taking, but something's holding uh, you? You know, it, it, it's uh, not necessarily that I know I should be taking. You know, uh, before I was playing poker, I was in the uh, nightlife business and restaurant yeah, business. And, and uh, part of me is uh, curious and interested about maybe, you know, what would I be like in the, in the night nightlife business a little bit. But, you know, especially now that I've gone and gotten married and everything, I don't really necessarily want that. But, you know, I, I have thought about having doing some sort of business on the side, you know, having a place, you know, wouldn't be a pool hall, even though I love pool, but that type of thing. It'd be kind of cool just to kind of create my own little name legacy. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I like that. And finally, how does poker make you feel? Um, it, the it, poker is a thing that I do. It's a it's a job. It's great that I enjoy it most of the time. There are times when I really don't feel like playing, but it's like, hey, you know what? <laughs> you got to put in the hours or whatever. Um, you know. Not everybody understands that, you know. Uh, somebody who puts in a lot of hours of poker, you know, can appreciate. Hey, you know what? Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's not so fun. And, you know, I try and not play when I'm not enjoying myself as much. You know, it's good to take some time off. If you're you're miserable playing, you know, maybe take some time off, enjoy something else. Um, but uh, I think I'm fortunate, you know. This is, you know, this is what I do. I play cards for a living and uh, have a pretty nice, decent life, you know, great family and friends around me. And, uh, you know, for that, I'm extremely grateful. And that's where we'll leave it. Thank you very much, John Robert Blonde. Really appreciate it.